Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm part of the Jewish community in Pittsburgh. Rabbi Friedman and I are inviting you to a discussion about Sukkot. Feel free to reach out to either of us, Rabbi Friedman on itsgoodtoknow.org, or you can email me at andrewdanielclinton at icloud.com, or follow me on Instagram at andrew 2 underscores clinton. Rabbi Friedman, how are you? Thank God. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. It's starting to cool down. I'm wearing a sweater. And you're in Alabama, so it's a little bit warmer than Minnesota. A lot. A lot. We just finished Yom Kippur. We're heading it. We just finished Sukkot. What's the meaning of Sukkot? Sukkot is actually eight days. So we've only done three days so far. Right. So we're right in the middle. And uh, the mitzvah is, the commandment is, to move out of your home and for all pr practical purposes, live in the sukkah. The sukkah is a temporary um, structure. The roof has to be made out of plants. Not, you know, not too thick so that it doesn't become a, a, an actual ceiling. And um, it's to re remind us that when God brought us out of Egypt and we spent 40 years in the desert, he protected us from the elements like the sukkah that offers some protection from the elements. The uniqueness of this particular mitzvah is that you do the mitzvah with your entire body. Like you eat matzah with your mouth. You give charity with your hands. You put tefillin on your arm and head. But this mitzvah, your entire body goes into the sukkah. Mm -hmm. And not only your body, but even your garments, your boots. You go into the sukkah with your boots. So it's an all-encompassing mitzvah, almost like a divine hug or embrace. Because now that we've had Yom Kippur and we're all forgiven and we have a clean slate, now God can embrace us and the embrace can be equal all people because since we're all forgiven now we're all equal mm -hmm. we all have a clean slate in the course of the year that's going to change some people will do more mitzvot some people will be do fewer but right now we're all the same and that's the other beautiful thing about a sukkah Every Jew can perform the mitzvah together with all other Jews at the same time in one sukkah, if it's big enough. Now, you have a pair of tefillin, only one person can put them on at a time. But with the mitzvah of sukkah, your entire body is included, and so is everybody else. So it's a great unifier. And the reason we can do this mitzvah so equally is because Yom Kippur made us all equal. So it follows naturally that after Yom Kippur and the forgiveness of Yom Kippur, now we can do two things. First of all, get together in one mitzvah, like there's no distinction between us. And secondly, we can do it with joy. So the mitzvah of the day is to sit in the sukkah, eat in the sukkah, and to do it with joy. So sukkah is the holiday of joy. As serious as Yom Kippur is, that's how joyful sukkah is. It's a fun time of the year. A lot of people, th it's our favorite holiday. When you ask people, what's your favorite holiday? 
a lot of people say soka. Yeah. So, so, so every year we're supposed to build one of these soka. We're supposed to build this thing and there's all these rules and there's a proper way to build it. What's the true way to build it? What's the right way to build a, um, a kosher sukkah, but also like a, a nice, fun, joyful sukkah? Well, you can see behind me, the walls are uh, half solid and half, uh, what is that called? Those panels? I'm not sure. Yeah. That was a strange name. Yeah, but it's really pretty, especially during the day. And then if you look at the ceiling, the top of the sukkah, it's bamboo. Oh, wow. Bamboo has become very popular in the last couple of years. Before that, we used evergreen branches, which really smelled, well, smelled really good. So the smell of sukkah is associated with evergreen. The bamboo doesn't have such a good smell, but it's so much more convenient. You can roll it up, store it for next year. It doesn't go bad. Whereas the evergreen, every year you have to have cut fresh evergreen bows. So it's got to be something that grows from the ground. Any plant will do as long as it's been cut. And you cover the, you cover the top with it. And then you have all your meals in the sukkah, or whatever activities you do, it's in the sukkah. And then the last day of sukkot, of course, is Simchas Torah, which is the happiest day on the calendar. So I want to mention something profound. The mitzvah is to rejoice in the holiday. Now, People wonder, and it's a good, it's a good question. It's a good, it's a good, um, it, it's a good conundrum. How does my joy serve God? God is asking us to be happy. Why does our happiness mean anything to Him? It's so flimsy, our happiness, you know. <laughs> You go, you go on, on, on the news and, and within five minutes, your happiness is gone. <laughs> so our happiness is really not very profound, not very deep, certainly not infinite. Why would it be so relevant and so meaningful to God? By the same token, <clears throat> Yom Kippur, if you regret your sins and you ask for forgiveness, you are forgiven. Same question. My regret? My regret is so flimsy. It's so shallow. How could it possibly be, be meaningful to God? And we're told that it is not only meaningful, it's infinitely meaningful. How is that possible? What's the explanation? The average person would be bothered by this. My emotion, my feeling, my mood. Okay, my mitzvah maybe means something to God. If I give charity and I help the poor, okay. I can understand that that might mean something. But my moods? How can that be significant enough to matter? Mm -hmm. So here's the secret. In every mitzvah that we do, we are imitating God. As the Torah says, just as he is compassionate, you should be compassionate. As he is generous, you should be generous. So everything we do that is holy and godly is imitating God. Imitating doesn't sound like such a nice idea. It's just an imitation. But really what we're doing is, we're going on the same page. To be on the same page with God, that's, that's meaningful. So 
concerning Yom Kippur. The truth is that before we ask for forgiveness and before we regret anything, God already regrets. He regrets the existence of sin. He regrets creating sin. He regrets creating the temptation for sin, the evil inclination in us. He regrets it. He hates it. And he wants to forgive us. That's the secret. Now, if we come on Yom Kippur, <clears throat> when he is already regretting and he is already forgiving, then when we add our little regret and our request for forgiveness, we're tapping into an infinite source of forgiveness and regret. Because now we're on the same page as him. And that's why our regret is meaningful and our request for forgiveness is effective because he's already forgiving from his part and he's already regretting on his part. We just need to join him. So it's almost like we're trying to emulate him to be more yes. like him and try to say, well, I know I can never be that, but I'm going to try my best to be as similar to that as I can. To, to add my little bit to the, to the infinite. I'll tell you a little story. My son, one of my sons, is one a singer. Of the ten. He's a singer, popular singer. He gets up on stage and he says, I was born in Minnesota. Born and raised in Minnesota. And he says, you know, I'm not the only famous Jewish singer from Minnesota. There's another famous Jewish singer. His name is Bob Dylan. And between the two of us, we have sold millions of albums. <laughs> you see, you add your 10 albums to his, <laughs> and you have sold millions of albums. So when we add our little bit of regret and our little bit of uh, request for forgiveness, to God's desire to forgive and his regret, well, then we sell millions of albums. <laughs> that makes it very significant. So the same is true with joy. The reason our joy is so significant to him is because today, during this holiday, he is uniquely happy. We add our happiness to his, it's really powerful and effective. The truth, of course, is that God is happy every day of the year. Happy with his creation. Happy with the progress that we're making. And even when there's disappointment, even when we misbehave, the world continues, right? So God still wants his world. He still wants his creation. He's still hopeful and optimistic that we will get our act together and the world will be perfect the way it's intended to be. So God is joyful every day. And that's why we have to serve God with joy every day. But the Rosh Hashanah, the anniversary of joy is Sukkot. And the joy that we have during this holiday <clears throat> will serve us, inspire us, carry us through the whole year. So we gotta be in, happy enough today for whatever is gonna come in the other days of this year. And then next year we'll start again. We'll get a new supply of joy that will last for the coming year. Just a really, a, real, a, a really interesting, it's kind of related, but it's kind of off topic. One of the interesting ways that some people look at happiness with God is, if you buy your wife roses, that's really nice. But if your wife doesn't like roses, she likes tulips. Does it sound nice, really? You bought her 
flowers, buying your wife flowers is nice, but you bought her flowers she doesn't like, but you like buying her roses. So a way that a lot of people look at Judaism is, okay, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, but I'll do ABC for Hashem, because I like this. This is meaningful for me. I'm not going to put on tefillin, but I'm going to wear a kippah because that's meaningful to me. I'm going to keep basic kosher. That's meaningful to me. But then other people say, I, I'm going to keep everything because Hashem says, this is how I need you to do things. This is what I need. This is how I need you to love me. So I guess the question is, what's the right way or is there a right way? Is it okay to pick and choose, you know, well, I don't want to do everything, but I'm going to listen to Benny Friedman in the car because that's a way for me to show love by listening to Yesh Tikva. Or do you have to keep all the mitzvahs, keep all the um, commandments, all, you know, all the mitzvahs? Do you have to keep everything or is it, is there, is it gray? I think we should ask the question a little differently. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not do I have to keep them all. Does God really want them all? And if he does, then why wouldn't I do them all? <clears throat> Can I do them all? No. So I do as many as I can. But I don't judge them by how it feels to me. Because what I'm doing is for him. Like you say, if he doesn't like roses, then don't give him roses if you're trying to serve him. If you serve him, you do what works for him. So that's why when people say, this kind of Judaism works for me. Well, that's nice. <laughs> Good for you. That's not called serving God. And I think that this is really a crucial issue in today's world. People today do not identify as religious. You can't ask people to be religious today. It just doesn't fly. People are not inspired by it. But when you say, God wants you to do this today, people are inspired. So it turns out so. we are much more selfless than we've been given credit. It doesn't have to work for me. Everything else I do in my life is for me. When it comes to Judaism, I want to break from me. I want to step out of me and do something awesome, infinite, true, eternal. If it just works for me, then it's the same as everything else I do. I don't but I guess the way to... A way to look at it is if Hashem needs a dozen of roses, is it better to give him a rose or no rose at all? Because he needs a dozen. Yeah, that's a good, it's a good way to put it. Every mitzvah, all 613, give God pleasure. Only if you do all 613? Of course not. Every mitzvah stands on its own. But is there a difference between giving him one rose because I'm saying, I can't do the other, I can't afford the other 11, but I can afford one? Or is there a difference from saying, I like giving roses, so I'm going to give him a rose because it makes me feel good. Is there a big difference there? Because the one is saying, I can only do this, and the other one's saying, I like doing this, so I'm going to do it. And, I, and it happens to benefit you, so that's great. But if I didn't want to do it, you, you're out of luck. Yeah, it should be the other way around. I will do this for you because you like it. And if it happens to benefit me, right, then that's a perk. No, but if you can do one rose, of course you do it. Because God understands our limitations 
and is considerate of our limitations. So a person who can afford only one rose and goes out and gets the rose, that's perfect. That's all God expects of him. And when you do what God expects of you, it can't be better than that. So, so what about the person that goes out and steals the rose? Because <laughs> you know, there's people that wear a kippa and take it off and put it in their back pocket, steal something and put it back on. What about that? That is so respectful of the kippa. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you do a mitzvah through a sin, not only is it not a mitzvah, it's also uh, a little blasphemous, sacrilege. Doing a sin and blaming it on a mitzvah? <laughs> That's nasty. Yeah, it's a, the, an example I'm thinking of is like you rob someone's house and you get all kinds of stuff and you get a ring and you give the ring to your wife and you say, she's really happy. She just got a beautiful ring and that's a mitzvah for make, you know, making your wife happy. But you stole the ring. So it's tough. Are you that really doing something nice? No. In fact, you're, you're corrupting something holy. So it's worse than nothing. A lot of people that I know say, well, a kippa isn't super important because it's, it's on halacha, right? But I think it is really important. Like, I believe that wearing a kippa is so important, but also it puts a very big responsibility on people because if you have a kippa on and you're doing something that's wrong and people see that, it reflects poorly on Jews. If you're being rude to the waitress and you have a keep on, everyone's going to say, those Jews are rude. So I think it's almost better. It's, it's kind of like a, almost like a sign of honor. Like if you're not going to do good, don't wear it. So I think a kippa is a lot more important than people think it actually is. Yeah, I feel that way about my beard. Walking around without a beard, you got to behave yourself. Because you represent something. You've identified yourself as something and you better live up to it. You're either a Jew or an Amish. You don't want to give the Amish a bad name either, do you? <laughs> so there's four interpretations of the four species. The other love and etrog. It's tough to pronounce. But what are some of the differences? So the other mitzvah of this holiday is to bring together four plants, four species. And the Torah tells you exactly which ones. A, a branch from the date palm tree before the leaves spread, uh, a myrtle, a twig from the myrtle plant, from the willow plant, and then a fruit that is called a citron. It looks like a lemon, but it's not. Very different species. Does it taste like a lemon? It, it's uh, <laughs> similar. but it grows primarily in Italy, in Calabria. What's unique about it is that it grows all year. It doesn't have a season. So it grows in the summer and it grows in the winter and it grows in the fall and it grows in the spring. In a sense, it unites all climates by growing from all of them. 
So the idea behind it is that since we're celebrating togetherness, unity, we take these four plants because they each represent a type of unity. Citron, we just said, unifies, brings together, unites all the climates. The myrtle is interesting because on the twig, three leaves grow from the same spot. And then another three leaves, and then another three leaves, all in the same spot. The willow grows in very thick uh, clumps, very close to each other. And uh, the date palm, before the leaves spread, all the leaves are tightly, um, tightly joined with the other so that it li literally looks like a stick. So each of them represents a togetherness, a closeness, a unity. When we take all four and unite them with each other, we're bringing together a total unity, which again, because we're after Yom Kippur, the world is capable of being so united that the four plants, each of them representing a union of its own, are united with each other to create a total unity. And they're pretty far apart geographically, right? Yeah. So before, how did people get them, before you had shipping and all of that, how, how did people get them together? It was a job. It was a task. Did they have like a guy in the community that his job was to go travel to Italy to oh, really? get these plants and the yes. guy they would get, they, they did? I never knew that. That's very interesting. Now, another aspect of these four plants is that a plant has a fragrance mm -hmm. and a taste. Or just a fragrance, no taste, or a taste, not much of a fragrance, or no fragrance, no taste. The willow doesn't taste good and it doesn't smell good. Maybe that's why they call it a weeping willow. <laughs> it's a, sta a sad state of affairs. The myrtle has a wonderful fragrance but bitter taste. The date palm has a wonderful taste, but not, a, not an especially pleasant aroma. Whereas the citron, the lemon-like fruit, tastes good, smells good. Now smell and taste represent learning and doing. A person who does a lot of good has a good smell, like a reputation. A person who internalizes learning, who accumulates a lot of knowledge, that's like good taste. Like when you eat something and you internalize it. So each of these four species represents a different kind of service of God. The lulav, the date palm, represents a person who excels in the learning of Torah. He doesn't excel in doing mitzvahs, so he doesn't have a good fragrance, but he has a good taste. The myrtle excels in doing good, so it has a wonderful fragrance. It doesn't excel in the study I mean, obviously, he has to study something to know how to do the mitzvah, but he doesn't excel in the study, so he doesn't have a good taste. The citron excels in both. 
So it has a good taste and it has a good smell. The willow doesn't excel in the learning and doesn't excel in the doing. So it doesn't have a good taste and it doesn't have a good smell. And yet, without the willow, the mitzvah is not complete. So the willow actually completes the mitzvah, is part of the mitzvah. So you cannot serve God without the willow, which means the community is not complete without those people who don't excel. Your average guy. This year, the willow stands out. No taste, no smell. <laughs> it came down with Corona. <laughs> so the willow represents somebody who came down with a virus. And yet without them, the mitzvah is not complete. When a person who doesn't excel in learning, and he doesn't excel in goodness, but he does a mitzvah, that is more precious to God than the other three. So when we build, when, average, uh, huh? God. when the average guy does something good, that's, that's a cause for celebration. So when we build our sukkah, do we have to put a mezuzah in the door frame? No. Because if you put a mezuzah on the door frame, you're treating it like a permanent residence. And the whole point of it is that it's a temporary residence. You're leaving the security of a well-built home and taking shelter in this flimsy little uh, shack that you put together yourself and you're not a carpenter. <laughs> I see these people, they have these fancy sukkahs and they have a door to it and it's like that's not even a sukkah but you know the people have these permanent sukkahs that aren't really a sukkah it's like uh it's like the people that put uh a mezuzah frame on their door without the mezuzah in it it's it, you're better off taping the scroll to your door than put in a frame right well the walls really are not the main part of the sukkah so if the walls are permanent that's okay the top has to be flimsy. Okay. So, can you have it set up so it's like a permanent thing where you don't take it down every year, where you just leave it up? Where you have okay. lights in it and all that? You can, but then in, in, when, the, when the holiday approaches, you rearrange the top, put on some fresh, because you got to do something to make it a sukkah for this year. But yes, That's you can keep the structure up all year. I didn't know that. So, everyone reads Kohelet during Sukkot. Why doesn't Chabad? Kohelet. <clears throat> there are five books of the Torah that are called Megillas, scrolls. Um, there's a custom in many communities that on different holidays, they read different scrolls. Um, the only scrolls that we read, or everybody reads, is um, Echa, Lamentations, which is on the ninth of Av, Tisha B'Av, and the Megillah of Esther, which is on Purim. The others, we don't have the custom of reading, like the Song of Songs, uh, Ecclesiastes, um, Mishle, we don't have that custom. So, 
what's the most important thing to learn from Sukkot this year? One of the reasons we celebrate Sukkot this time of the year and not immediately after Pesach, which would make more sense. Right. Because this is supposed to remind us of the coming out of Egypt. So why don't we celebrate it in the season when we came out of Egypt, which was in the spring? So the explanation given is, if you move into your sukkah in the spring, no one will know that it's a mitzvah. Because everybody is moving outdoors in the spring. They've been cooped up in the house all winter. Now the spring is coming and everybody's moving out to their, to their veranda, to their, uh, to their pergolas. So we specifically celebrate Sukkot when everybody else is moving back into their house because it's the rainy season. And that's when we move out of the house into the sukkah, which gets people's attention because it's surprising. What about in the south, though? Because this is the season where it starts getting nice. Yeah, well, it's you can't the... win because... <laughs> what? We can't win because it's going to be warm someplace in, on the globe. So we go <laughs> by what's happening in Israel. So this year, we should be ready. We should expect all sorts of surprises. Nothing is going to be the way you think it's going to be. Right. So we have to so, be ready for a year of surprises. I think it's going to be a good year. A very good year but surprisingly good, astonishingly good. Everything we took for granted, people are going to come to appreciate, and it's going to be so much better. I don't know. Have you ever not eat ice cream for six months, and then one day you're craving it, and you go get it, it tastes, and you're really thirsty? It tastes so good. That's what normal is going to feel like here as soon as this blows over, and hopefully it blows over soon. Do um, you have anything Maybe else you want to add? Than that. Maybe even better than that. You're craving ice cream because you haven't had it in a long time, and you go out there, and to your surprise, you find something you like even more than ice cream. And it's free, and you get hot fudge. And you don't even know where it's coming from. Right. That's the kind of year we want. It's, uh, it's going to be a good year. It's going to be a good year, I can feel. That's the right attitude. Do you have anything else you'd like to add on Sukkot? Well, the last day is going to be Simchas Torah. Simchas Torah is a powerful and inspiring reality. Because I remember when, in the, in the bad old days of communism, the only day that Jews felt safe enough to express their Judaism in Russia, in the Soviet Union, was on Simchas Torah. It was too dangerous to come to the synagogue on Yom Kippur. It was certainly dangerous to come on Shabbat every week. But on the night of Simchas Torah, all the young Jews, the students, those who attended communist schools, who were members of the Communist Party, but on Simchas Torah, they came to dance with the Torah in the streets of Moscow. I'm going to ask you a question. And if the listeners know what I'm talking about, the Rabbi Friedman veterans, there was a guy from Russia that got exiled. And uh, the story was that he got caught put it on to fill in and the guy gave him a lantern. He said, no, give me yours on Shabbat. You know what I'm talking about? So 
that guy, how did that guy that was so very clever and observant, he figured out a way to circumvent everything else to make it work. What did he do on Sukkot? How did he build a sukkah? What did he do? It's a very good question because where he was in the North Pole, there were no plants. There was nothing, nothing grew there. So it was impossible for him to make a sukkah. And he was in prison, so he couldn't even build one. He. He had well, he the hide to fill in. He couldn't, it, it yeah. was very tough already. Yes. But that year that, we're, that you're talking about, he was in exile. He was not in a prison. Okay. He was exiled to the North Pole, to this little village called Che, right? <laughs> Near the river Ob. Now, the, the communists had built an office building where everybody else lived in huts, in yurts. Um, the communists built a building. So he did find some scrap lumber. Now you can make the walls of the sukkah out of snow. As long as you cover it with something that grows. So lumber comes from trees. So he found a few scraps and he made himself a little sukkah. I thought you were going to say his beard grows, so he, right, I'm kidding, but um, I think uh, we'll leave the, it. The amazing thing is, these chassidim, as tortured as they were, um, hundreds of them, outlasted the communists. The communists were determined to destroy all religion. But these, this handful of chassidim, they outlasted the communists. They outlived them too. So it was literally the victory of godliness over godlessness. And today, Judaism is thriving in the former Soviet Union. It's so impressive. Someone told me yesterday that within 25 years the orthodox world is going to pass up the secular world jewish secular world is that true is there going to be more orthodox observant jews than you know secular jews or a reform reconstruction is concerned all other jews i think most people making that comment or that observation are thinking birth rate You're right the birth rate in traditional families is 10 times what it is in a secular family. So do the math. How many kids did you have? 14? Four girls and 10 boys, right? Yeah. That's a, how old were you when you had your young oldest? My first? Yeah. 22. What about your... Youngest, how old were you? Yeah, older. <laughs> 14. And that, that's a lot of kids. I can't imagine the yeah. food bill. <laughs> it's expensive. But I think we'll leave it there, Rabbi Friedman. Um, we would like you to email us um, about your recommendations and questions so you can contact Rabbi Friedman at it's good to know.org or email me at Andrew Daniel Clinton at iCloud.com. Shalom Aleichem. How are you? You know, I do a lot of talking, a lot of Zooming, many classes, many subjects, but that's all formal stuff. Hopefully good stuff, but formal. We also have a Wednesday night meeting that's more informal and kind of um, Hamish. If you want to join us for that kind of an event, um, interactive, 
time for questions and so on. If you want to join us for this side of conversation, click on the link below and join us every Wednesday night at nine o'clock. Well, maybe not every Wednesday night, but we try to make it every Wednesday night at nine o'clock, a more informal chat, which uh, can be more enjoyable at times than the formal stuff. So check it out, click on the link and join us. Try it, you'll like it. <laughs>